Acts chapter 14, we're just looking at the first seven verses. And, and, and seven verses. But sometimes as I'm going through the book of Acts and as writing any sermon, we can and I can get so focused on the text itself that if I'm not cautious, sometimes a study can go in a direction that, that goes off the trail. And God has a tendency to step in and say, hey, Damien, look, let's hit pause on this. And let's step back and take a panoramic view of the bigger picture again. And so, in, in that moment, I, I kind of, oh, okay, I see I veered off course. Let me come back here. And so that's what this message kind of is. It's an opportunity for us to just, we've been in Acts for over a year now. It's time for us to kind of recalibrate with the big picture on what God is doing, not just then, but here and now in our lives today. And as you're reading the book of Acts, I, one of the things that stands out uh, very quickly is Acts is a, a, a book about movement. You don't find people standing still for very long in their relationship with God. And we tend to think, well, when we look at the apostles like Paul and Barnabas, they have to keep moving because they're apostles, they're missionaries. That's their job, right? They go out and to be moving for Jesus Christ. But often we refer to our relationship with God as what? A walk with Christ. And so even in the nature and how we look at our relationship, movement is just a natural, ingrained understanding, expectation that we have in what our relationship with Jesus looks like. But is this something new with the apostles? Or has motion always been a part of our worship with God? And that's what I want to look at here a little bit. Um, I have all of these scriptures in your outline. Do not feel the need to jump around and, and try to keep up with uh, looking them up in your Bible. If you are able to do that, kudos to you. You get the gold star today. But I want to look at three individuals. I want to look at Abraham. I want to look at Moses. And then I want to look at just the nation of Israel as a whole. On uh, what it looks like to worship God. Worship God. In Genesis uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, listen to this. Now, the Lord said to Abraham, go out from your country, your kindred, your father's house, to the land that I'm going to show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great. So great that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him. So God calls Abraham to move. And Abraham moves. Worship 101. God speaks, we receive and obey. Worship 101. God speaks. We listen and obey, and that's what's happening here. But sometimes it's not easy to obey God. We have internal resistance, or we face external resistance. It gets hard. Sometimes saying yes to God feels like we're trying to trudge through a mucky mile. Other times, it's easy as running on a trail, downhill. But for Abraham, what were some of the internal things that may have caused him to pause and reflect on, does he really want to follow God? I'm too old. I'm afraid. I don't understand. God, you give me this vision. I don't understand how it's going to come to pass. Those things could have been circulating in his mind. But what does the scripture say? He got up and he went. He trusts God, put his hand in his as a father who leads his child and walked with God. Next, we come to Moses, the patriarch that everyone is still talking about in the book of Acts. God sends Moses to go into Egypt to be his voice and his outstretched arm of deliverance. And Moses goes. But the internal resistance, and I have this down. I want you to read this week. We're not going into it, but Exodus chapter 4 walks you through the story that I'm going to capture right here. As God extends to Moses this invitation to move, to go, what were the things that Moses might have been internally facing that was trying to slow him down or cause him to resist answering God? No one will believe me. You're showing yourself to me. That's great. By ourselves on a mountain around no one else. That's how cults start. God, what do you mean you want me to go and tell people that you have revealed yourself to me? No one's going to believe me. The second one. Okay, God, I'm not a good public speaker. You don't understand. When I get in front of people, I choke up. I can't do this. And then finally, I'm afraid. God, they, they want to kill me. You're sending me into the lion's den. But Moses goes. God calls Abraham. Abraham goes. God sends Moses. Moses goes. But I want to look at something that's even more just incredible than that. Let's look at the nation of Israel. 
And I, and I broke this in two parts. Again, it's in your outline. You can follow along here. But first, God calls Israel, and then God sees Israel respond to his invitation to come. But let's look at this. God calls Israel. Abraham and Moses, they had to respond to internal conflict more than external. But now the nation of Israel, God's saying, come to me, worship, and let's go on a journey. Now they want to, but they have external resistance now. They have a pharaoh, a government, a militia that's saying, oh, no, you're not. I don't know this, God. You will not. You are not. You won't. So they have external resistance. And as God is calling the nation of Israel out of Egypt to worship him alone as God, God calls. Israel desires to respond because nobody wants to stay enslaved, right? Egypt stands in the way. Over the course of time, Moses appeals to Pharaoh, whose resistance brings the power of God against the false powers and gods of Egypt. God is showing everyone, Moses, Pharaoh, Israel, Egypt, he's showing everyone that worship is obedience to all he says. It begins by calling, he begins, God, by calling Israel something very precious and wonderful. And I love this. This is one of those moments where you just want to explode, stop, drop, and roll. Listen to how God refers to the nation of Israel. Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. And what this is saying here is that God, we have this idea and culture has this idea. The firstborn son is the inheritor. It is that the, they capture the best of hope, ambition, desire, and goal for you to see lived out through your son. There's so much invested, especially a son of royalty, a firstborn son. And that's how God refers to the entire nation of Israel. In the New Testament, we say there is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free, male nor female. We are all one in Jesus Christ, right? That's how God declares that nation. All of the nation. I value them the same way you value this one son. Now, as a father, I'm telling you, command me, let my son go, that he may come to me. If not, I will take your son. I will take your son. God is referring to the entire nation. There is not a single person in that nation of more value than the other. God wants all of them, and he'll settle, settle for not one less. To do what? To come serve him. The next time we see in Exodus chapter 5, Moses talking to Pharaoh. Serving becomes observing a feast. <clears throat> After Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Okay, first you want to leave. Now you want to go and have a feast in the wilderness. What is this? What is this worship that God is desiring? Exodus 7, 16, you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. So God is appealing to Pharaoh through Moses to let my son go that he may come and serve me. What does serving God look like? Obediently coming to where he is calling and observing a feast. What is that feast? Well, we'll look at that in a minute. But now at this point in time, Pharaoh has resisted. But in this resistance, God is showing Israel the value that they have with him and that it is not something, worship is not something that just involves one part of the family. It involves the entirety of the family. God is after everybody, husband, wife, son, daughter. It matters not how you fraction yourself out. God wants you. He's always after the family. This involves everyone. Exodus chapter 10, verses 7 through 9. So Moses and Aaron went back to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God. But which ones will go? And Moses said, and I love this, I always want to say it in the Charlton Heston voice. <laughs> it's so royal, so prestige. Listen to this. We will go with our young. We will go with our old. We will go with our sons, and we will go with our daughters. We will go with our flocks, and we will go with our herds. In other words, everything. Everything is being brought to worship God. It doesn't just involve all of them. It involves their possessions. Pharaoh called Moses and said, go serve the Lord. 
Your little ones may also go with you. Fine, we're not running a daycare here in Egypt. Take them. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. But Moses said, you must also let us have sacrifices and burn offerings that we may sacrifice the Lord our God. Our livestock also must go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must take them to serve the Lord our God. And we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. And I, I love what Moses is saying. It's like, look, I don't know what this is going to look like. But God has called me to tell all of Israel that all of you, everybody in your home, everything that you own is to vamoose out to the wilderness to worship God. That's great. What is this going to look like? I have no clue. I'm just trusting and obey. And as he stands before Pharaoh, who wants to see what this is going to look like, I don't know. I don't know. This is insane to Pharaoh. Can you imagine this? What do you mean you don't know? You're going to churn. Our, our, our nation is being turned upside down just so that you can go and say yes to God. Who is this God? Who is this God? Finally. Israel comes to God. God calls the nation of Israel. Somebody standing in the way of Israel responding to God. And God takes that resistance out of the way. And the timing to remove that resistance wasn't because it was difficult. It was to show that nation as well as Israel who God is. He is not slow concerning his promises. Israel comes to God. Now they face not just external resistance. Egypt is out of the way. Now they face internal conflict. Are we going to obey God? Now I'm going to tie this together with us today because it has a rhythm and, and this defines the very heart of worship. Up to this point in time, worship is simply God speaking and us obeying. Songs, psalms, hymns, the rituals, the traditions, the things that God gave, the things that people developed, the roles that people would play, all that comes later. And that's a part of it. But the heart of worship right now is always God speaks. And if we obey, we worship. That's our worship, obeying what God is saying. Listen to this. As they are leaving, they observe a feast, the feast of Passover. Exodus chapter 12 records this. You can read this this week. No, we're pressed for time. I'd love to go through all these, but look at it. Chapter 12, verses 43 through 51. But they celebrate the, the Passover because of the haste of having to leave Egypt. This ties into the celebration of the Lord's Supper that we observe in all the wilderness that we find ourselves sitting and observing in, in the wilderness of this world. Because God leads us where he intends to bring his kingdom and, and this idea, so I had this question. I want to answer it here. The question is, if we are filled with the Spirit, why do we keep saying, why do you keep saying being filled with the Spirit? Isn't, don't we have all of the Spirit of God? First, we see that the apostles are filled and filled over and over and over. What does this mean then? Look, yes, we have all of God through His Spirit in us, but there's still more of God. I don't know how else to explain it other than this. We are filled, and if God places me from and says, Damien, here, look. Leave Texas, come here to Pompton Plains. I'm filled with the Spirit through that whole process. But I come here obediently, that's my worship, and as I'm here, he pours into me, already full. Now what happens if you pour more water into a full glass? Overflows, Overflows right? It's simple in the, the sense of understanding it, profound beyond how I can explain it, beyond that simplicity. That when we are where God wants us to be, he will always pour himself to overflow because he cares not just for us, but also the people and the places that he is leading and positioning us into. So they observed the feast of Passover. But now this, this part, this part came to me on one of the runs this past week. And I just had to stop running and just worship God. Listen to this. This comes from Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 through 22. Israel is moving now at the leading of God. What did it look like? Well, first, we see that God is leading them. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt, equipped for battle. See, God is leading them with the intention of maturing them as a father does his son. And I love what this is saying. They left Egypt equipped for battle, but they were not mature to face the battle. And see, when we place faith in Jesus Christ, we're resourced with all of God's kingdom the moment that faith is placed on us. 
He is going to lead us to mature into that. And that's a process. And that can be hard. And that can be scary. And it can be frustrating. But understand, we have everything we need from the moment we say yes to Jesus Christ. We have everything we need. And we have to trust that God is working through us. You say, Pastor, well, what if I sin? What if I mess up? The Bible is full, especially in the Old Testament. Zechariah, oh goodness, three or four, one of the two. He talks about, yeah, you've messed up really bad. Yes, you deserve my wrath, but in my grace, I'm going to step in. And the Hebrew picture of that is that here we're safe. Israel, as a child, wanders away from mom and dad, and they go into a place where God's wrath is coming down on sin. Now, God is a father saying, well, yes, you deserve that. I told you not to walk past this mark, but he doesn't leave them there. He comes out like this and receives it and brings them back over here. See, God is committed. Trust him in the process of growing us into our anointing, teaching us how to hold the shield, how to swing the sword of truth, his word. And it's not just the leading part of it. I mean, right? Listen to this. Now Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones with you from here. Not only is God leading them, Israel celebrates the faith that was fruitful in their past through Joseph. And we, we often overlook this. Egypt wasn't, wasn't a total bad experience for Israel. It became one, but it didn't start out that way. They, were, they experienced the best and the worst of times. See, they're choosing to recognize and celebrate the best, but still moving onward and leaving Egypt. Egypt was a place of life for them at the beginning under Joseph, but it became a place of bondage. And by honoring the best of the moments with Joseph, Israel as a nation, even though it has become something that God is leading them out of, they want to celebrate the wins of yesterday while looking forward and moving into today on into tomorrow. And I, and I want to use this illustration because it, it just it's so frustrating. But then I thought, man, this is such a good illustration. Our foster son refuses to look where he's walking. <laughs> this is him. And, and, and there are a few times. It's very frustrating. I've, I've saved his life many times. I'm convinced, especially on those stairs back there. But the, sometimes I'll let him go, and he will, boom, fall flat down. The principle of that is you have to look where you're going. See, this is where we struggle. We don't want to just celebrate the past. We want to live in the past. God isn't there. He's over here, and he's leading. He's moving. But this is how we're living. But God, and then, and then we fall down. See, that's not how celebrating the past, celebrating faith is to look. We celebrate and we move on. That was great. Thank you, Jesus, for this. Thank you for this. Thank you for this. I'm ready for tomorrow. Let's go. It's time to leave Egypt. And so they're leaving Egypt, choosing to remember the good of their experience there. And then finally, they're following God. And they moved on from Sakoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. Constant movement, right? And the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people till they arrived. I love this. We see God leads them. We see that God is, is empowering them to celebrate the victory that faith brought in their times past. But Israel is continuing to follow God. They're, they're learning. And see, remember, they have the armor to face battle. They're not mature in it yet. And right now, they're children like this. And God is leading them patiently. Why? To teach them to look forward and to mature in the anointing he has placed over their lives. Because where they're going, they're not ready. But by the time they get there, they will be. Trust God in the process of what he's doing. But movement and change are all necessary factors, not just in the Old Testament. What about in the New Testament? Is, is, is movement something that ju just was then and not now? Listen to how Jesus viewed kingdom ministry. Well, those who come to Jesus and those whom Jesus calls are faced with the reality that worshiping God, worshiping being defined as God speaking and us obeying through Jesus, what it will look like. What it looked like for Jesus you couldn't hold him down. He was constantly on the go. What did it look like for his followers? If 
you want to be a follower, you got to do what? Sit at home and catch them on Facebook? Catch the live feeds? You had to get up. You had to participate. You had to walk with him. Listen to how Jesus describes kingdom life. This comes from Luke, same author of the book of Acts. Shirts and socks. Now, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And to another, he said, follow me. But that person said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. Wow, Jesus. What a heart. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those in my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. All of this is describing an exaggerated representation, this idea. Are we walking with God or are we being drugged by God? See, Jesus wants our attention focused on what God is leading us into because it is maturing us for the anointing that he has placed over our life. Why is there such an emphasis for us to mature in our faith? Because the more mature we are, God puts us on like a glove and has no resistance to do everything that will bring his son glory. And the only way that we become more and more like that is to grow up and mature in our faith. We have to stop being this dragging child and we have to look and we have to walk alongside and we say, Lord, are you leading me into this? Let's go. So we're like the Jonathan who says, look, it doesn't matter if we have an army or not behind us. We have the God Almighty. Let's climb this hill. And who knows that he won't give us the victory against all of the opposition. See, that's where my heart desires to mature into. And I just imagine seeing God as a father smiling at the faith and the courage that Jonathan had, that it mattered not if he was just with a sword bearer. Hey, look, God is going to do something incredible, and I want to be there in case he chooses to do it. See, that's where I want my faith to be at. Constant movement, constant movement. And this mission of Christ is a ministry that was handed to the apostles, and even us today, I dare say. But how does God lead us? I mean, Israel, they were led by a pillar of cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night. That's crazy, right? Think about that. What is cloud? Mostly moisture, right? And what's interesting about clouds is they tend to just continue through the air and absorption, continue to replicate moisture. So it's almost like they have a, a, a representation of water and a representation of fire leading them. Baptism almost. It's crazy. Think about this. The Holy Spirit is referred to as water and he's referred to as fire in the baptizing work that he does. What if, and I know this is crazy, this is assuming that the author of the Bible is, is, is just one. <laughs> and this is assuming that it all actually has to do with Jesus. What if that was a picture? Very real people, very real circumstance, very real event. But what if it was a shadow of something far greater? And what if we are all baptized in the same spirit? And instead of following, he is in leading from the heart. Listen to this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. So set roots up. You're going to be here for the long run. No, what? And all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Jesus didn't just have moving from town to town in mind. He had a global vision in mind. That's a lot of walking. The Spirit has come to fill us. We no longer need this cloud or fire externally to follow. But inward conviction... Through the intimacy of doing life together, we celebrate traditionally Pentecost Sunday this weekend. Listen to this, Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven the sound of a mighty rushing wind. It filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them, rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so now, now, instead of following an actual cloud or pillar of fire, they're looking and seeing a cloven fire tongue above their heads, held with the Spirit of God to go. And where do they naturally go? Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem. They, again, worship. The heart of worship is God speaks. We obey and they obey and they're there in that upper room. And what happens? God doesn't just fill them with the spirit of God. God pours in an abundance that overflows. And as they naturally, as water will naturally go down the path of least resistance, this room 
of 120 plus people are now flowing down into the streets. They could do nothing else because of the overpowering flow of the Spirit of God pouring into them. And we see this happening in the book of Acts with the apostles. When they are facing resistance, when they are standing against opposition, this God fills them with his spirit. Why? To overflow the reality of who he is, which is greater than the, than the reality of what they're facing. Reality of what they're facing. So all that to be said, worship, the heart of worship in the Old Testament was God speaks, and if we obey, that's the heart of worship. In Jesus' day, if God speaks and we obey, it's the heart of worship. In the New Testament, looking at the book of Acts, and for us today, if God speaks and we obey, that's worship. And in every piece of that, movement was always a part of it. Movement is always a part of our worship with God. Now back to our text, Acts chapter 14. Incredible introduction, right? Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time here in verse 7, or uh, 1 through 7. But I wanted to give us kind of that big picture coming back to Acts chapter 14. Now, last week, we looked at Paul and Barnabas. They were at Antioch of Iconium. And they were witnessing and sharing to the point the whole city came out, right? Remember that? And, and some people were not happy with that, and they resisted it. And the apostles were pushed out, and they shook off the dust, and they moved on. But did the gospel witness? Did the kingdom move on? No. The Spirit of God is now very present and filled. Why? Because people place faith in Jesus. See, faith is never conditioned on the apostles being there. It's conditioned on the Spirit of God bringing life through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so now this city is exploding with kingdom representation, and the apostles move on elsewhere and they find themselves in Iconium now and here in Iconium we find in verse 1 Iconium, Iconium they enter together into the Jewish synagogue because that's where you start right it's Paul really done with the Jews but as he comes it says they entered together in the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed See, the same place that they're beginning, the synagogue, you have the word of God already rooted. You have people that want to be governed by the Bible. You have people that want a relationship with God. And Paul is showing them that you can walk right past these things and come straight to God through Jesus Christ. And this was really good news. In verse 2, it says, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. And so this battle is raging for the hearts of Iconium. <clears throat> As Moses goes into Egypt and stands before Pharaoh and declares God's word, Pharaoh refuses, increases the bondage, and now the people will question Moses. And so you have a house divided, right? You have an effort, a work that's very divided. And imagine the weight on Moses' heart. Well, we see that same heart today as we minister the good news of Jesus Christ, right? You have those that will believe, but then you have those who will resist. And they'll resist on different pieces of it, not necessarily the whole of it. Yes, God loves us. Yes, God is with us. Yes, his kingdom is coming. I just don't believe it's through Jesus. And even today in the Christian church, we can say that we believe all this stuff. But if our lives are not obedience to what God has spoken, where in the Bible has that ever been viewed as acceptable worship? Where is it? When we were living in Texas, we faced a decision to come to New Jersey. We could have said no. We got to a point where we were looking for a reason to say no, but we couldn't. Would God still have done something? Would God have broken us and healed us and mended us and moved us forward? He's a good father. But saying no to him would not have been worship. Saying yes to him is the worship that he desires. Because of that, our lives have been transformed in incredible ways. I mean, God, literally, I, I'll be running and just have to stop because God's spirit just pours out in this moment. I've never had the intimacy that I have with God right now. Anytime in my walk with him. Keep saying yes. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles. They poisoned their minds against the brothers. They're not just attacking the message. They're attacking the character of Paul and Barnabas. See, to represent Jesus and to have it rejected, you're not just going to be rejected. It's not just your message, but it's going to be your character that's attacked. 
You, you are preaching that God is the creator of everyone and he has the right to say what is good and what is not good? You, you mean that he has a right to define marriage? You mean he has a right to define life? You mean he has a right to define this? Well, you're stupid. You're ignorant. You're a hick. You're uncultured. All these things that come to attack. Why? Because we feel like if we can attack the messenger, we can nullify the message. Strike me down today. God's word doesn't change. And if it's faithfully preached, it will be the same message from generation to generation. That is the love of God. Otherwise, God could just pour his wrath down on sin and all that are swept up in sin be removed with it. So we preach and we labor like Paul and Barnabas and we experience the effect of those who believe and then we experience the effect of those who don't believe and attack us. And they attack us. But what do they do? They remained for a long time and they spoke boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. As Egypt would see the signs and wonders of God affirming his power over their gods, over their governments, Iconium is witnessing the power of Jesus against the dominion of sin. Signs and wonders are done in the city. Everything Jesus did, they are doing now. But this city is divided. Verse 4, some sided with the Jews, some with the apostles. And this is interesting to note. This is one of the first times that apostles is applied to someone that wasn't part. Now, Paul was referred to as an apostle born out of due season. Barnabas is being included in this. And the idea that is perpetuated with this is that the apostles now are missionaries, not necessarily the anointed leaders that began with Jesus. And I just want to caution that. I don't see that in Scripture. And I think we go into very dangerous areas to where we put an emphasis on certain portions of Scripture and not the whole flow. God continues to anoint and to gift for the work of gospel ministry as Jesus began all the way up until Jesus finishes by returning to receive his bride. So just, just be cautious with how we approach the idea of apostle. But now he continues, despite this gospel being both proclaimed and demonstrated, the city was divided. And you think, wow, if Jesus would just, and this is the same thing now, if Jesus would just do the miraculous signs through us that he did in Jerusalem's day, this church would be packed, right? We could go in the street and our shadows would bring healing. In the name of Jesus, this church would be packed, right? It wasn't then. In fact, Jesus said if someone would come back from the dead, it still isn't enough to convince people that this is true. Nothing that we will ever do will ever take the place of the Holy Spirit through the break wall of conviction leading a person to come through the blood of Christ to be washed and cleansed of sin through the atonement. That is a work that only God does in his timing. We have to be faithful to be faithful despite the timing that God chooses to bring breakthrough in a person's life. Listen to how Paul described this later on in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. See, Paul learned this, not by looking like this. Well, God, maybe if you would have done this, that person might have believed, and God dragged him along. It was like, all right, the dust's off, let's continue. Hey, God loves you. Jesus died for you. It's walking face forward, recognizing God will deal with what is now the past. We need to focus on walking forward with him into the tomorrow that sees his kingdom here in greater strength, vibrancy, and power. Verses five through seven. Now, when an attempt was made by both Jews and Gentiles with the rulers to mistreat them, not only is it enough that they are going to be frustrated with Paul and Barnabas, now they're involving the authorities to mistreat them and they want to stone them. And they learned of this who Paul and Barnabas and they fled to Lystra Derby cities of uh, Laconia, which we'll look at next week, into the surrounding country. And there they continue to preach the gospel. See, Paul recognized when it was time to leave because he knew what stoning looked like. And when you see the stones picking up, maybe that's the Spirit of God telling us it's time to go on to the next city. And so that's what they do. Now, did the Spirit of God leave with them? No, it's the same thing that happened. You cannot have gospel witness come in and have no fruit. There are always going to be seeded realities of the kingdom through the gospel of Jesus Christ rooting in, even if we don't see the fruit of it. 
in Iconium, there were people that may not have placed faith in that moment, but would later on with someone that would come later. And Paul wrote later that he never left a city without investing and empowering people to lead those who had come to the faith. Paul didn't just wash his hands and say he was gone. He was always investing and developing leaders. He saw every gospel opportunity as an opportunity for a cocoon to pour into somebody for the timing to break out and to be the leaders that God has anointed them to be. See, those everywhere Paul goes, he was always doing that. But as resistance is mounting and rumors of stoning, the apostles move forward. See, again, here we go. Movement, movement. They're constantly going because there are others who have yet to hear. So what does this mean for us today? Application points. Movement is always a part of the journey with God. Today, we do not follow a pillar of cloud nor of fire. But we are filled with the Spirit of God, who leads and positions us for his kingdom. Where he positions us, we observe the Lord's table. It's central to who we are. Just as Passover was for Israel, deliverance from Egyptian bondage, Passover is essential to us because we are all sinners saved by grace. Not one person in this room who has placed faith in Jesus is of any greater value to God than the other. We are all Join heirs, co-heirs with Jesus Christ. And as he sees his son, he sees you and I. And this is really, really good news. Where he positions us, we are faithful to observe that it's all about Jesus. We celebrate the faith winds of yesterday without walking, wanting to live in yesterday. We submit to his work of maturing us into Christ. But I, I, I can't emphasize this enough. The moment we start saying no, the moment we pull our hands out, the moment that we think we have life figured out and it's got to be this way, we're going to stop growing. It doesn't happen any other way unless we're walking with Christ. If we choose to not be in his word, if we choose not to be in prayer, we cannot grow in his leading in our lives. And we're always going to be that perpetual child. It's cute in its rightful season, but an adult acting like a child is not. And a Later on in life, it just gets more frustrating, right? It's God's heart is to see that I'm not having to lead you in the hand like this. What would it look like to walk alongside? Because I can trust you not to step out in front of a car. Because I can trust you not to run off. Because I can, we can cultivate this. And Jesus said, even in the development of his relationships with the apostles, with the disciples, right? I called you my servants. I called you this. We had this relationship. You are my friends. See, that's what he desires, that companionship, us walking with him. That only comes with saying, yes, Jesus, yes. We listen and obey through his word and spirit and go and share the gospel in both proclamation and demonstration. Obeying God requires us to move, to be moving. We have to learn to be okay with that. We have to learn to be okay that, and I wrestle with this, and I get this. This is a very heartfelt moment. There have been many times Lacey and I have wondered if we're a good fit, if it's not time to move on. We have had very heartbreaking moments to look and to see just there are so many ways that we're not rooting in and seeing experiences that we had growing up being afforded to our children. And we just wonder, are we failing as parents? Are we failing as, as a pastor in this congregation? Are we failing? Again, on my runs, God just breaks my heart down and he speaks, but it's a sense that there is no better place to root into than him. And that can be done anywhere. The kingdom of God is going to be eternal. Rooting down in a place and saying no to God is not sending the children up. And I get this, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm appealing to all of you. I can't tell you the countless times I have people leave the church because we don't have youth, or we don't have this, or we don't have that. And down the road, Pastor, I need your help. What the, the program-driven ministry you went to, your children walked away from? Maybe it was never about preoccupying them or giving them the things that we thought they needed. What if, like our daughters, it's a mom and dad who are on their knees in tears and prayer, begging God to work through, allowing God to work through, and being faithful to find satisfaction in the place that God calls us to serve. 
I grew up the only child in my Sunday school class most of my life. I have a relationship with God that I have yet to meet somebody I would trade it with. And I'm not saying that to boast. I'm saying that I love all that God is showing himself to me to be. And if that journey is what it took to get here, sign me up to do it a thousand upon a thousand times more. Movement will always be, sacrifice will always be, letting go will always be a part of growing and maturing into our yes to Jesus Christ.